welcome and good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are um, coming into uh, this um, webinar format, uh, panel discussion, um, launch of Vectors of Fascism. Um, the, um, the event itself is, uh, is being held uh, in Vancouver, it's being hosted in Vancouver. All of the participants this morning here um, are based in uh, uh, Vancouver. So um, I'd just like to acknowledge that it, it, the event is being hosted on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Um, I'd also just like to thank um, uh, our co-hosting institution, which is the Van City Office for Community Engagement. And we actually have um, the director with us uh, as a panelist, that's Am Johal, whom I'll introduce in, in just a second. Um, just a, a, a brief word about um, the way the, the book launch um, has been working. It's just not uh, a, a one-off event today, as, as many of you will know, but perhaps not, uh, not everyone uh, will know that uh, we started uh, last week. This is our second installation, and we're going to go next week, so exactly one week um, from today, same place, same time. Um, the way the launch has been organized is in terms of the three um, sections of the book. Uh, the book is subtitled Historical, Theoretical, and International Perspectives. I don't know if you can really see that properly. Um, so last week was, of course, the historical perspectives. This week will be theoretical uh, perspectives. And then next week, we will uh, look at international and contemporary uh, perspectives. Um, sadly, I have to say this book only uh, gains in, um, in its timeliness uh, with every, it seems, uh, day and week um, that uh, passes. Uh, what we've seen in the last uh, um, few days, the brutal uh, execution of George Floyd uh, by the Minneapolis police, um, and then um, an insurrection uh, demanding really uh, the uh, officer's um, charge, um, uh, which seems to be in the works now uh, uh, from what I've uh, read. Um, but also in the context of um, the response to the insurrection, we've had uh, Donald Trump um, just a few hours ago tweeting um, and echoing a, a particularly brutal uh, Miami police chief um, that if there's looting, there'll be shooting and talking about perhaps even sending in the military to quell um, the disturbance. Uh, this has led then to Twitter saying that tr Trump has um, violated their guidelines on glorifying violence. Now, now think about this. Um, social media platform is criticizing the president for um, violating its own guidelines against glorifying violence. Um, not only that, you have uh, the spectacle of two CNN journalists and one producer being arrested on camera um, brazenly. I mean, that, you know, uh, it has to be said by the um, Minneapolis Police Department. Um, so this is the situation that confronts us today. A um, couple of days back, you had a senior uh, economic advisor of Donald Trump's saying, um, uh, that we uh, we are ready to uh, uh, get the the wheels of the economy back rolling. Um, our human capital stock is intact. Mm -hmm. So it's very clear that you know the, the, the open message is that um, human labor, human labor power, particularly um, the the labor power of black and brown. Uh, people, black and brown workers, uh, is expendable. Um, so this is this is our contemporary moment. This is what we're facing uh, today. So um, without any further ado, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce, um, first of all, the format of our um, of our launch, and then, of course, each uh, of the panelists. Um, the panelists will speak around 15 to 20 minutes. Um, they will both address 
the, the chapters um, that they have contributed to, to this book, as well as um, maybe reflect a little bit on that contemporary um, situation. And then uh, we will have um, a, a, a question and answer discussion period um, towards the um, end of our session. So if you could, if, I'm sure there'll be many questions and comments, but if you could hold off um, sending them to us till the end, then it'll be just easier to manage. And if you could keep them as concise as possible, that would also be very helpful. I'll be um, going through them and, and posing the questions to the, to the panel. And so the, the more concise they are, um, the, the better uh, able I'll be to, uh, to communicate them to, uh, to the panel. So without any uh, further ado, um, I'm going to introduce all the panelists uh, in, in one go, and then they will go in the order in which I introduce them. So uh, as I mentioned, we have um, Am Johal with uh, us today, and he's the director of SFU's Van City, for, um, Van City Office of Community Engagement. He's also the author of Ecological Metapolitics, Badu and the Anthropocene, as well as co-author with Matt Hearn uh, of Global Warming and the Sweetness of Life, A Tar Sands Tale. Uh, Laura Marks works on media, art, and philosophy with an intercultural focus. Her most recent books are Hanan al Cinema, Affect, Affections um, for the Moving Image, and Enfoldment and Infinity, and an, an Islamic ge Genealogy of New Media Art. And last but not least, Hilda Fernandez Alvarez, who works as a Lacanian psychoanalyst in private practice and as a psychotherapist registered with the BC Association of Clinical Counselors um, for a public institution, which is Vancouver Coastal Health in Vancouver, uh, Canada. She's also the author of numerous publications and get, has given quite a number of, uh, of talks internationally. Um, I'll be going last in talking about my contribution and I'll try to uh, bridge a little bit um, the theoretical uh, section, which is what we're looking at today, uh, and the contemporary um, uh, uh, perspectives panel, which will be happening next Friday. So um, I'd like to now just turn the floor over to um, uh, Anne Johal. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Samir. Just wanted to, uh, of course, uh, thank Samir and the Institute for the Humanities, Hugin, and everyone for carrying on this radical legacy at SFU, and also uh, recognize that we're on the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh uh, peoples was an honor uh, to take part in the free school with Unit Pitt Gallery over at Selector, Selector Records in Chinatown back in uh, 2017. And sadly, as Samir mentioned, uh, things have uh, continued to follow a, a particular uh, course of authoritarian uh, populisms, uh, phantom fascism, zombie <laughs> neoliberalisms, and this contradiction between the democratic uh, polity and uh, a liberal economy. And this uh, claustrophobia of the present sickness that colonizes our bodies and the, the unconscious itself, the desires uh, for an imagination for an outside and the freedom to be oneself, to be together with friends, community, comrades, a desire for a different political imaginary, or as Elaine Badu would call it, the possibility of the possibility of, of something new. Now, the word fascist comes from uh, fasces, a bundle of sticks tied to an axe, and the fasces was carried by the bodyguard of a Roman imperial magistrate as a symbol of, of his authority. And uh, it, it, it combines a, a series of, of features, a hatred of democracy, the necessity of violence, biology as destiny, national identity, people are better off sticking to their own and that politics is, is everything uh, in, 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 in uh, climaxing into uh, a notion of, of uh, totalitarianism. Uh, my contribution to the book uh, involved um, uh, looking at the work of, of, uh, of Carl Schmitt. So I'm just gonna reference uh, parts of that now. Uh, throughout his life, legal theorist Carl Schmitt was a ruthless critic of liberalism, parliamentary democracy and cosmopolitanism, especially in his notorious and unforgivable Nazi period when he was the regime's crown jurist. Even if the reactionary political actors of today haven't read Schmidt and certainly echo his ideas both knowingly and unwittingly and construct political strategies based on a de facto friend-enemy distinction, and perhaps 
unsurprisingly, it's the far right that has catapulted itself into the hallways of power in this time of economic crisis and ecological catastrophe as a paradoxical, hardened avant-garde of an already conservative establishment. It has captured a distorted idea of political change and order simultaneously and fomented anger and hysteria towards migrants, refugees, minorities, black, brown, and indigenous bodies into a refined political project that is being self-consciously and deliberately replicated with varying degrees of effect internationally, uh, such as Steve Bannon's attempt to create a, a neo-fascist international. But the political mobilizations of resentment that have been launched with this toxic inertia seem to have had multiple successes on numerous fronts, particularly in consolidating ultra-conservative policy and appointments to the U.S. Senate under the stewardship of hyper-partisan Republican Senate leader Mitch uh, McConnell. The progressive left has also fallen in on itself in its failure to articulate the root causes of the political moment the time when the democratic establishment have landed on the listless insider, Joe Biden. If Herrick uh, Hobsbawm once called Thatcherism the anarchism of the lower middle class, Trumpism has taken this idea to an absurd new level. The post-democratic horizon in this young century has Schmidtian overtones and reverberations echoing throughout it by Considering Schmidt's work through key texts such as dictatorship and political theology, what can, one can see that there's a lot that is old in the new authoritarianisms that are emerging today. But Schmidt, of course, should be approached cautiously. Matthew Spector poses the following question in his critique of the contemporary use of Schmidt on the left. Can the former Nazi crown jurist be intellectual friend and political enemy simultaneously? Can we separate Schmidt's insights from his intentions? Spectre argues that salvage operations often failed to deliver on their promise. Is the attempt to refashion Schmidt's ideas in such a way as to serve progressive critiques of the liberal order and ultimately class struggle a Schmidtian project? Spectre argues that bringing Schmidt's insights into a leftist project is historically incoherent and simply not worth the tangentious stretching and pulling necessary to turn him into a progressive and emancipatory egalitarian thinker. Doing so would distort his actual theoretical project and personal politics. Yet the use of Schmidt carries a radical cachet in the post 9-11 world among certain aspects of the progressive left. Others argue that he should be read carefully but against the grain, but there's a danger again in reading Schmidt ahistorically. The specter argues the value of political antagonism in Schmidt can be found in Rousseau, Kant, Hegel, and partly in many others like Gramsci, Rosa Luxemburg, Lenin. Schmidt is an accomplished writer who traffics in seductive epigrams. It is in the search of something beyond the neoliberal political cul-de-sac, particularly post 9-11, that the present moment of the strongman and new authoritarian illiberalism opens itself up to a renewed potency in Schmidtian ideas and rhetorics across the political spectrum. With these qualifications in mind, it's important that we start with Schmidt's own work on the very concept of dictatorship. Schmidt provided a book-length historical analysis of the legal concept of dictatorship in 1921. For Schmidt, dictatorship is a reasonable legal institution in constitutional law and has an avowed purpose. For him, the concept of dictatorship changed from the Roman period to the present through its integration into the theory of the constitutional state. Literally, the dictator is one who dictates. However, a commissary dictatorship becomes a mandate given by the people. The very move to a form of sovereign dictatorship is part of the process of dictator dictatorship itself. As Schmidt writes, quote, the law, which is essentially a command, is based upon a decision related to the public interest. But the public interest only comes into being through the fact that the order has been given. The decision contained in a law is, from a normative perspective, born out of nothing. It is by definition dictated, end quote. Dictatorship is also something that fits firmly into a political matter. It solidifies processes of secularization. As Schmidt writes in Political Theology, all significant concepts of the modern theory of state are secularized theological concepts. The very process of secularization for Schmidt means the domination of reason over the authority of scripture. For Schmidt, dictatorship is part of the work on decisionism, determining if the proper procedure has been followed by the appropriate authority, in which he builds on ideas from Machiavelli's Prince and Hobbes' Leviathan. 
Schmidt is attempting to determine how decisionism can be understood in both the juridical and political context. The questions that Schmidt poses could certainly be asked in the present political moment with potency. Who should be the guardian of the Constitution in times of crisis? Who should be given extra legal powers to save the Constitution, to restore public order and security when the welfare of the people is under threat? In other words, who is the sovereign? Uh, end quote. Who makes the decision, as Schmidt famously claims, the sovereign is the one who decides on the state of exception. And for Schmidt, as he writes, dictatorship is the exercise of state power freed from any legal restrictions for the purpose of resolving an abnormal situation, in particular, a situation of war and rebellion. Hence, two decisive elements for the concept of dictatorship are, on one hand, the idea of a normal situation that a dictatorship restores or establishes, and on the other, the idea that in the event of an abnormal situation, certain legal barriers are suspended in favor of resolving the situation through dictatorship. The concept of dictatorship has emerged during the last few centuries in state theory and in politics, but the term has been generally used with great imprecision in situations where an order is followed or a rule is being exercise, the concept develops from a legal Roman institution called dictatorship. Quote, Schmidt argues that extraordinary conditions require extraordinary measures. Dictatorship is the exercise of state power freed from any legal restrictions for the purpose of a leader resolving an abnormal situation, in particular a situation of war and issuing orders and executing them without having to obey traditional legal and parliamentary processes. Schmidt discusses Machiavelli's consideration of Aristotle in the differentiation and parsing between the coming to decision on one hand and its execution on the other. Rational techniques of political absolutism were necessary for a leader to employ from time to time, as the argument goes, particularly as an exception in the time of emergency. The state of exception is theorized as a legitimate tyranny because of the decision to suspend the law is given freely to the leader as part of a constitutional process and order. For Schmidt, whomever rules over the state of exception ultimately rules over the state. He asks through Machiavelli, should the king depend on the law or the law depend on the king? And for Hobbes, the law is not a norm of justice, but a command, a mandate from the one who has supreme power therefore wants to command the future actions of the members of the state. Schmidt writes that the decision contained in a law is born from nothing. It is by definition dictated. Sovereignty emerges from a constitutive act of absolute power made through the people. But the question is whose decision carries the day in the end and by what authority? The matter does not depend on the ends, but rather on the decision about the means to those ends, end quote. Schmidt is particularly interested in the movement from the supreme command of war to an absolute parliamentary power that rules all other institutions in a centralized manner. In essence, this is the movement from revolutionary dictatorship to commissary dictatorship. Delegated authority, dictatorship, constitutional norms, and the law become entangled inside of the emergency and democratic and constitutional implication regarding the decision. In the nationalist and illiberal context currently haunted by the specters of fascism, sacrifice for the nation becomes paramount as a faith-based exercise. The popular sovereign decides to enact violence or send people to death based on the subjective nationalist faith by not only maintaining the monopoly over violence, but in determining when, how, and why it gets used. It establishes and embodies a distorted and deliberately blurred democratic vision in matters of life and death. Liberal constructions like international law are not acknowledged as existing in real life, but optional processes to consider in the realm of the political in this ultra-nationalist worldview. And as uh, Jeff Mann from, from here at the SFU has argued, since the state of exception has indeed increasingly become the norm, it begins to lose its critical purchase as a concept. Like Trumpism, uh, Schmidt also believes in the homogeneity of the people in order to assert this political grouping as a norm of politics. Democracy can't exist for all humanity, but only for a people that is constructed along homogenous lines. Without an ethno-national homogenous political unit, a strong state cannot exist in Schmidt's view. Then who belongs to the people then? 
constructing a political context where the people rule, it is necessary to determine the identity of the people. And this, for Schmidt, can only be done by emphasizing the division between an us and them, or the friend and enemy distinction. Liberalism has a relationship to all humanity that Schmidt, like many anti-enlightenment thinkers such as Burke, but also reluctant modernists such as Arendt, view as failing to create a sufficiently specific political community. The very criterion of the political for many of these thinkers and current political leaders is based on, on uh, variations of this friend-enemy distinction to varying degrees. What is and isn't legitimate or allowable remains in the realm of the politically contestable. Schmidt argues that the state is not just another neutral arbiter between a plurality of communities or accounts of the good life as in liberalism. A weak state that acts merely as a referee is incapable of asserting political power on behalf of the people. For Schmidt and other neo-authoritarians neo of our present moment, pluralism leads to dangerously, dangerous disunity and the potential for chaos. To look at their specific local contexts and different political dynamics that have been mobilized in the name of the people, it's important that we don't conflate the figures of the moment like Erdogan, Modi, Orban, Putin, Trump, uh, and others. Uh, while there are some similarities in their mode of taking power, forms of centralization, and varying commitments to neo-authoritarianism, their approaches uh, have fit into their own specific nationalist context and some attempts to understand the mobilization of public support and historical resentments that they traffic in is necessary. What they do have in common is their capacity to create enemies both within and without in order to reassert and rearticulate a new reactionary vision of the nation and who constitutes it. Friend and enemy is also about the creation of winners and losers against a constructed establishment. The very real corruptions of the liberal state, both real and perceived, are a common denominator and calls for a purification of the nation. Now I'm going to turn to Schmidt's work in, in political theology. The state and political leaders ought to be concerned with the major question of the ever-present possibility of conflict, according to Schmidt. For Hegel, the state was the realization of the highest, most rational form of existence. The role of the state was to secure the conditions where private citizens could actualize their public wills. The state of exception and decision to enact such a moment is based on which authority in the state is competent to decide such a matter. For Hegel, the state was rational precisely because it mediated and reconciled the particular, the individual, and the universal. Stability, order, and political unit are the definitive goals of the state in this worldview. Schmidt was concerned with the question of which authority has the capacity to determine that these concepts have been restored. For Schmidt, it was only in the, in the midst of crisis that sovereign power revealed itself. On that basis, sovereignty can only be determined in the borderline case and not with the normal routines of parliamentary democracy. Schmidt evokes the notion of a situational rather than universal law, whether to change or suspend laws according to the crisis at hand. And so for Schmidt, all law is situational law. The stress on sovereignty reveals where true power resides, and therefore the study of emergency as part of the theory of the state is crucial to unpacking the concept of, of dictatorship. And as, as Schmidt famously writes, the exception is more interesting than the rule. The rule proves nothing. The exception proves everything. It confirms not only the rule, but also its existence, which derives only from the exception. In the exception, the power of life breaks through the crust of the mechanism that has become torpid by repetition." End quote. For Schmidt, the exception thinks the general situation with intense passion and argues that every government is part of a continuum of dictatorship in its actual practices. The state is governed by the ever-present possibility of conflict. The purpose of the state is to maintain its integrity, to ensure order and stability. Schmidt's critique of liberalism centers around its attempts to depoliticize politics by avoiding fundamental existential decisions. Schmidt argues paradoxically that because liberalism tries to serve all interests, it is not neutral contends that all forms of political authority are grounded in violence and that despite the attempt of liberal political orders to cover, this, uh, cover over this violence, the traces of this inherent violence are increasingly visible. Uh, Schmidt's critique of liberalism centers on liberals, liberalism's attempts to depoliticize political thought. 
Ar uh, Schmidt argues that today, nothing is more modern than the onslaught against the political. There must no longer be political problems, only organizational, technical, and economic, sociological ones. And for Schmidt, the notion of the political has four features. The concept of the state presupposes the concept of the political. The political precedes the state. The political is a basic characteristic of human life. And the affirmation of the political is the affirmation of the state of nature. And so when the political emergency arrives and the Schmidians of today emerge inside of the all too real institutions of power, the political ground beneath our feet begins to shift and the abnormal contemporary political condition emerges into a state of hypernormalization. The techniques of political combat become asymmetrical and the very grammar of political conflict is reorganized and the very capacity to resist becomes ever more compromised, perhaps to the point of becoming irretrievable. The 21st century forms of a post-democratic order and the specters of fascism and new authoritarian concepts emerge, take shape in real time and are taking on particular features and contours of earlier, earlier periods of the 20th century, particularly that of the strongman, the nation, and enemies within and without. These nefarious forms of political border keeping may not be a replication of the 1930s, but the pathetic reappearance of the zombies like Trump, Mitch McConnell, David Duke, uh, and so on, uh, as a kind of grotesque return of the 1980s on steroids back with a vengeance. But will the future pretend the continuation of this new authoritarianism, or will it be a return to a liberal order, the formation of a robust uh, or the formation of a robust and critical democratic socialist orientation. The present political culture seems to hinge on the very divisions of friend and enemy that liberal politics attempt to disappear. What is inside or outside the polity is a perfectly Schmidian question that reemerges in these sick times and accelerates the assault on political reason that is the present day fashion. The American president seeks to clearly define the external enemy, a different one each day, as radical Islam or China or Mexicans, and the internal enemy as immigrants who are always already potential terrorists. It is a polemical rhetoric intended to put political adversaries on the defensive because of the overly wide net that it casts. In his attacks on judges and the judicial branch, Trump presents himself as a sovereign above the law. The reality of the contemporary emergency is not whether we use Schmidt or lose Schmidt, but that the political emergency has indeed already arrived. The state of exception has very much become the rule. We must therefore get back to the more central question. If we can't organize an agonistic politics of solidarity in this concrete political moment when everything intellectually, spatially, temporally, somatically, subconsciously, existentially is clearly at stake, then when can we? Thank you. Thanks very much, Anne. Um, now we'll uh, move to uh, Laura Marks. Great, it's a, it's a real pleasure to, um, to be here uh, with some of my uh, fellow contributors to this wonderful book that Samir has put together. Um, out of an urgent need that um, uh, expressed itself in 2017, though even at the time, Samir was emphasizing that the, our concern about fascism reaches um, deep into, uh, into uh, historical culture and continues to be relevant. Um, and uh, I'm grateful to Samir for uh, the assignment that he gave me or, uh, for, for my contribution to the lecture series and the book, which was to um, talk about Klaus Tavelite's book, uh, Male Fantasies, um, which was a kind of a terrifying assignment for me because back in the, um, I guess in the late 80s, uh, uh, I read this book and it uh, it marked it marked my um, uh, thinking and programming for uh, quite a while until I, I fled from the approach that it offers. Uh, so uh, my talk 
uh, my paper was um, which came first fascism or misogyny a uh, super cheerful title uh, reading Klaus Tevelite's Male Fantasies. And I'm going to just uh, overview my argument and then um, relate it to uh, our current situation. So uh, Klaus Tevelite's Male Fantasies was um, published in Germany in 1977 in the context of the first post-war generation's attempt to deal with Nazism through a return to Marx and Freud. And it was uh, translated and published by Minnesota University Press in 1987 uh, in two volumes of uh, more than a thousand pages. And it's based on the journals of um, uh, the Freikorps soldiers as well as novels. And the Freikorps were um, paramilitary groups of World War I veterans and leftists who felt betrayed by the uh, end of the war, who fought battles against the Weimar Republic, assassinated left leaders, and um, were some of the uh, origins of the Nazi party. Uh, Tableite mentions that this book, Male Fantasies, is part of a larger history, larger history of the ways the European male ego develops in opposition to woman. Um, and I underscore that word history. So as I mentioned, this, uh, these books will really, volume one, Male Fantasies, Psychologizing the White Terror, um, had a big influence on my, my uh, very earliest um, work theorizing and uh, film programming in the 90s, including my uh, terrified flight from psychoanalytic theory in favor of, uh, well, the schizoanalysis of Deleuze and Gattari and the existential phenomenology of uh, Merleau-Ponty, which gave more embodied theories of the subject. So, uh, Table Lights, Volume 1, Male Fantasies, Psychoanalyzing the White Terror, is a study of masculinity, which at that time, the uh, 1970s and uh, 1980s, was a rare topic. And um, he identifies a male hatred of women, a fear of bodies, and the resulting armorization of one's own body. And as well as hating women, the Freikorps hated Bolshevik and the masses. So this was an elitism, not a populism. And what uh, one of the things Tavolite does in the book is to intervene in the psychoanalytic discourse of the time um, by arguing that fascism lies not in Oedipal identification with the father, but a pre-Oedipal fear of dissolution back into the mother. And uh, the problem that um, uh, Patrice Petro summarizes in his argument is, as uh, she writes, Tavolite's notion of pre-Oedipality tends to make the dread of woman primordial rather than cultural by conjuring up some very archaic associations which link femininity and the maternal body to destruction and death. So my reading of the book um, uh, is in two parts. Uh, first, it tests what, what it would be like to believe that uh, the fear of women is a primordial, uh, ahistorical tendency. And second, what if we believe that this is a historical phenomenon? Okay, so which came first, fascism or mis misogyny? Uh, the ahistorical answer, uh, fascist misogyny is universal. So this is very depressing. Um, Tavolite analyzes the Fry Corps' hatred of women, and uh, they divided women into white and red, the familiar uh, virgin whore dichotomy. Um, one of the questions that uh, arises from this study is, um, arises to me, is why do people hate women so much? And why is it not only men, but women also learn to hate women? to despise each other and despise ourselves. So an answer coming out of uh, Tableite is um, uh, 
what fascist ideologies do is they grow personal fears into unifying ideologies. Of course, most hatred is motivated by fear, and most people fear death more than they fear anything else. Um, similarly, people fear others who threaten their identities, and people hate what reminds them of death. Um, so Tavolite explains how this hatred focuses on women. Uh, in most of our societies, I argue, the definition of a woman is somebody who is fucked. You can think, you know, when uh, you think about in many cultures, somebody says, uh, calling, when you call a man a woman or say that you're fucked. And in fact, if you, if I can extemporize for a moment, if you think of all the, um, curse words there are, they're almost all um, about women who have been fucked or wrongly fucked. Um, so you are fucked. Why should that be an insult? It should be, if we really think fucking is good, it should be great, uh, but it's not. You're fucked. You're a bastard. You're born from a woman who should not have born you. You're a mother fucker, um, etc. cetera. In, uh, in Arabic, the very worst thing you can call somebody is... Uh, Charmut, which means, um, uh, it's like, I'm not even going to say exactly what it means because it's really horrific, but it means, it means you've been fucked so much it has broken you. So in many societies, men who allow themselves to be penetrated are despised because they've become like a woman. So this uh, being, the capacity to be fucked elicits this uh, dread, this hatred. So Tableite argues in male fantasies that the soldier males hate women because women's bodies appear to be more physical than men's bodies and more mortal. Obviously women have vaginas, uh, we menstruate, give birth, and have menopause, not something Tableite talks about. Uh, our bodies turn inside out on a regular basis, revealing the bloody insides. And uh, regular sex involves the insides of women's bodies, which is an orifice. And that appears to the ignorant as a wound. But of course, uh, the vagina or the vulva is not a wound. It is a healthy orifice and in a very cool way the cervix and vagina are not insides they're they're folds they're uh, deep folds and in fact our whole body is a very deeply folded surface men's too men just unfold a little bit differently in the history of um, embryology so Tavolite notices in these uh, fry corps soldiers uh, journals and also in novels that appeal to them a terror of the cunt and the swallowing wetness and slime, and also a terror of losing one's boundaries in, org in orgasm. So this is really interesting, um, both of uh, merging and therefore losing one's boundaries and of dissolution from within and losing one's boundaries, and terror of being a cunt. Uh, as well as um, a hatred and terror of men who let themselves be fucked, uh, which we could extend to a terror of people who suggest that the boundaries between genders are porous. Uh, uh, next, I want to talk about armored bodies, armored bodies and the myth of the phallus. Uh, you notice that most cultures um, dignify their leaders by disguising their bodies uh, in a uniform or a suit. Uh, when a couple dress up, the man disguises his mortality in a suit, uh, and the woman reveals and enhances hers in a revealing dress. Um, so Tavolite departs from Freudian and Lacanian psychoanalysis, um, which suggests by suggesting that the ego uh, 
which for Freud and Lacan had to be male or masculine, can only build itself by seeing others as opponents to be assimilated either through identification, which would be certain other men, or taken as objects, which would be women, the weak, uh, foreigners, and others. Now, when I started out studying uh, film in the in the late 80s, um, the field was still dominated by Lacanian psychoanalytic theory um, and a really kind of, um, I don't want to say bastardized, a vulgarized version of this theory came down in my field, which was so-called a gaze theory. Uh, the theory that a viewer, male or masculine, attempts to identify with a phallic power uh, that men never in fact possess. Um, so that, that part of the theory is fine, but a mistaken reception of uh, Laura Mulvey's gaze theory ravaged our field of uh, film studies, and in fact, far beyond. It was a very influential mistake. Uh, for generations of people learned that men actually possess this uh, gaze of power and would say things like, she's a victim of the male gaze, and stop looking at me with your male gaze. When in fact, the theory says that men can only identify with phallic power if they deny their own physical and mortal body as the Freikorps soldiers desperately tried to do. Um, to have a body, to be mortal, means not having the phallus ever. Uh, and similarly, nobody has the gaze uh, except uh, a few very powerful um, you know, military leaders and maybe um, Amazon. So why don't people talk more about the vulnerability of the male body, about those uh, those exposed sexual organs that I think make men uh, very vulnerable. Why do people say phallic when they mean penis-like? Okay, so that was a section about an ahistorical um, uh, reading of Table 8. Am I doing fine for time, Samir? Okay. Um, now, uh, let's try a historical answer, because Tavolite does say that male history is a larger part, uh, male, male fantasies is a larger part, uh, I'm sorry, is part of a larger history of the ways the European male ego develops in opposition to woman. So there's some comfort in Tavolite's reference to the history of this supposed development of the male ego, because it is historical. And that allows us to study how historically um, the uh, armored or um, disembodied uh, male ego uh, rises and falls and to look for its end. Um, of course, it, it also requires, so thinking about uh, subjectivity and embodied subjectivity historically um, demands that we remain alert to new forms of domination that are perhaps not so much based on the body, but also to be aware of the presence and emergence of cultures where the idea of the self is not one that is armored against others, but that is open, is okay with its borders being indistinct, uh, is not overly afraid of being annihilated uh, by, by others, um, is oriented to others with care, uh, is built, uh, not on a sense of an individual self as much as a, a, a network or an ecosystem, and an idea of self that acknowledges mortality. So these... Um, good kinds of subjectivity, uh, I'm arguing, in a way are the despised feminine values. But we are all mortal, we are all vulnerable, uh, and therefore, you know, it, the problem is simply that um, historically some people, especially men, have been able to uh, pretend uh, that that was not the case. <clears throat> 
Uh, we are all mortal, all vulnerable, and therefore we all need to cultivate care, openness, vulnerability, and other kanti characteristics. And uh, we can see this happening among uh, certain indiv individuals, movements, uh, for example, the environmental movement. So uh, in, my, uh, in my chapter, and here again, we happy to be fucked, which is a capacity shared by all humans. And I say, let us all be cunts. Um, as I pass to uh, relating this to our present period, I also want to give a shout out to um, sexual selection, which uh, Elizabeth Rose, among others, but especially Elizabeth Rose, um, celebrates uh, as um, being as important, if not more important, than natural selection. Now, the theory of natural selection um, uh, to, to the idea that one must dominate others in order to survive was uh, uh, dominant at the time of, uh, of the Fry Corps, um, but it was a misreading, uh, a misinterpretation of Darwin many argue, where what was downplayed for a long time was sexual selection, the idea that um, um, evolution happens because uh, uh, plants and animals are attracted to their potential uh, mates um, by pleasure, attraction, beautiful scents, colors, um, beauty and seduction and the pleasures of senses are good for us and they're what they're the, the engine of evolution they're not decadent treats for us to enjoy after we've uh, destroyed all our enemies and uh, battened down the hatches so I think a simple shift to celebrating um, the um, the way all species survive and thrive through um, sexual selection, beauty, pleasure, and seduction um, would, um, would uh, really ease up a lot of these uh, fears of um, the, the body's boundedness. Okay, so now uh, in my last few minutes, uh, I'm going to relate uh, Tavolite's ideas in male fantasy to the misogyny in particular of the far right today as well as uh, homophobia, uh, transphobia, and uh, racism. And I still, you know, as I said in 2017, and I still uh, think I believe this, in a way it is a relief to have all that hatred I'm just going to talk about women for the moment, uh, speaking as a woman. In a way, it's a relief to have all that hatred finally on display. And of course, I'm talking about uh, the displays of, by the President of the United States at that time. Um, instead of having that misogyny behind liberal misogyny, Uh, to um, fix things through representation, which fails. Um, oh, it says my connection is unstable. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Uh, and uh, say the same with the homophobia, transphobia, and racism. Um, to a certain degree, it is, it's better to know better to be able to see and hear our enemies. Finally, um, how this topic re relates to the, the, the politics of the current we are seeing fear most because they remind us of our more than our dependence. Uh, when the U.S. president said a few weeks ago, if we could keep the, more, the number of dead to 100,000, that would be a very good job. Uh, he was speaking of um, 
of old people. Uh, and as Samir reminded us of the black and brown workers um, uh, and thought to be expendable. So I want to talk about these for a moment. Um, this fear and hatred of the most vulnerable of all. Guys, so I'm talking about um, the fear and hatred of the most vulnerable uh, at this during our pandemic. Uh, talking about um, the fear and hatred of old people. Why is it so difficult to recognize a person's entire vital existence, their life, when we see them old, frail, forgetful, and incontinent? Because we recognize ourselves, recognize our own mortality. Uh, people whose bodies are weakened the result of systemic racism, diabetes, obesity, high blood pressure among African Americans and indigenous people, which are not their individual faults. Um, they are expressions of um, centuries of systemic racism. Uh, also during this pandemic, we're witnessing skyrocketing violence against women. Uh, the fear and hatred is also directed toward migrant workers, where nations feel shame to recognize their dependency on people they despise. Um, so I do want to note that, um, uh, Samir, are you saying something else? OK, because uh, I am uh, just about done. I want to note that those of us who can afford to be disembodied to, uh, in a phrase that I find really distasteful, work from home, um, need to really um, fight to maintain our embodiment and to, uh, to build embodied solidarity with others and support an embodied uh, body politic. Um, and just in the last little note, actually, no, I'm going to, I'll just leave this note for our discussion. So I am done. Thank you very much. I really thank, you. Say. thank you. Terrific talk. Um, and I think especially your, your, your um, discussion around this process of arm, um, uh, of, of bodies in, in, in particular ecosystems and, and this concern with mortality becomes really magnified in this in this pandemic, um, mm. getting all kinds of you know uh, uh, difficulty. So uh, I hope we can come back to that in the discussion. Those are really important points. Thank you very much. So uh, now I'd like to um, turn the floor over to um, Hilda. Thank you, Samir. Um, <clears throat> many thanks for inviting me to this important book. I feel truly honored to write alongside all these um, great thinkers, scholars, activists. Uh, in the time that I have here, I will talk a bit about my chapter. So do you want a master? Psychoanalytic considerations on the intellectual responsibility in light of traumatic repetition. Uh, this chapter develops central theoretical notions for my PhD uh, dissertation, which I am currently writing very slowly, by the way. Um, and it's an ongoing, this particular chapter took me a good year to write uh, because it's a result of an ongoing dialogue with uh, Samir particularly, who apart uh, from me, a very good friend, he's also a, my committee member for the PhD program in the Department of Geography at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. I conducted a research study at Vancouver Coastal Health to map the discourses of trauma and healing in the mental health institution to propose a psychoanalytic approach on how to read the institutional unconscious. My research is based on Lacan's theory of discourse, which he developed at the end of the 60s in response to May 68. The title of the chapter, So You Want a Master, comes from a famous response that Lacan gave to enraged radical students for his apparent passivity in the context of May 
68 in Paris, he answered this. What you aspire to as revolutionaries is a master. You will get one. That was a milder version of what he had voiced 10 years earlier about the intellectual left suffering from a sort of metaphysical knavery, which I will talk a little bit about when we get to the role of the intellectual. But Lacan of the 70s, uh, uh, it's at the core a Lacanian reading of Marx, which informs the vast Lacanian left. And um, for Lacan, uh, the, the, the uh, word structuralism is defined as simply seriousness. Uh, it's the, uh, his engagement with historical materialism, it's really uh, trying to um, interconnect the psychic elements, particularly about the way we enjoy and how that connects to the larger discourse of the social. So he is really interested with uh, this theory of discourses on what are the real effects, but opaque, of the structure, what are the causes of this course? So, although I am trained in social sciences through psychoanalytic geographies, and also I have a master's in literature, my main field and understanding of psychoanalysis is derived primarily from clinical practice. And so this chapter engages with the specter of fascism from a perspective directly drawn from the clinic. I deploy logical principles that are used to conduct a treatment towards a certain cure, which corresponds to the arrest of compulsion repetition and to inscribe something of the death drive. These are not totalitarian or totalizing um, processes because we are always um, suffering for, from certain compulsion to repeat. We are um, subjects uh, subjected to resistance, which is um, greeted in the body. So that is incurable. But the treatment of analysis allows to find paths of exit of that deadly uh, repetition to engage with life. So I kind of try to bring that model that I practiced in, in um, clinic clinical uh, practice to the uh, political. I de-escalate um, the concept of political action from a presumed social totality to the level of the individual act, particularly to the individual act in the immediate social cell of the institution. By institution, I mean the couple, family, the friends group, the workplace, the strata, the university department, the police department, etc. Akin to what Gary Genosko does uh, following, following Watari in chapter uh, 10 of uh, the same book, uh, he's engaging with micropolitics of fascism. My chapter highlights the micropolitics of psychoanalysis and the centrality of an imminent, imminent an imminent critique. If a practice and imminent critiques is excluded or are excluded from psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis doesn't exist. It has absolutely a practice and it has an imminent critique. Otherwise, it's just another theory which we can get off theoretically. Psychoanalysis involves always an ethics in the sense that being the unconscious, a disruption that troubles, it only exists when a subject in their thirst for truth inquires into what uh, is that which one has stumbled upon because the unconscious is always a disruption and then calls for a uh, a certain uh, awareness of a response ability. So this is at the core of my uh, thesis, my argument. I'm going to share uh, the the um, how do you say here? I'm going to share these um, while I am talking. <clears throat> 
so just just to kind of map a little bit uh these are the four uh five theses the unconscious is ethical there's a subject of the unconscious and i'll talk a little bit about master signifier the traumatic residues or the remainder that uh lead us to a politics of inscription and therefore the intellectual responsibility so um to instantiate briefly what do i mean by subject of the unconscious and to defend psychoanalysis from a common objection that renders it as only about individual cases i will bring an example of this week's tragic events regarding black lives in the u.s that um samir mentioned at the beginning this sadly instantiates the specter of fascism but also exposes how a subject of the unconscious is always within a relation a social relation so it's not about one individual it's how do we participate and and um, uh, create social links of certain nature you don't have to be an analyst or a social theorist to see the logic that connects to these two events. Some background for those who are unaware. Amy Coopers, this woman, uh, was pulling a current, or she was currenting the term that is used in digital culture to refer to a middle-aged white woman obnoxiously entitled. In this case, the woman called the cops unjustifiable against the black man who was asking her to put the leash on her dog in Central Park, um, New York. She now has been fired from the investing firm she was working for after a video went viral showing her on a hysterical attack of white supremacy. The same day, few states west in Minneapolis George Falcon, a 46-year-old black man, is assassinated, recorded in plain sight. He's being slowly choked to death by a white uh, police uh, member, in spite of the fact that one can hear him saying, I can't breathe, and in spite of the community presence demanding to stop the assault of this innocent man. This atrocious case can be analyzed with regards to the subject of the unconscious in a social link. In Lacan's theory, this example corresponds to the master discourse, which is a social bonding who organizes people around the master signifier of domination. In this example, the signifier one is white supremacy. The discourse relates to both their relationship or um, yeah, before going into that, I just uh, yeah, want to say discourse is the connection of uh, uh, individuals that organize in certain mechanisms of the social bond. And Lacan uh, defined uh, discourse as the fundamental stable relationships of one signifier to another signifier that subsists in language without the need of speech. So in other words, these things, in spite of the truth that we can share, let's say, about the injustice of this situation, they keep repeating. They keep repeating, and, and that's uh, what uh, a structuralism, or particularly Lacanian psychoanalysis, is trying to see how this mechanism works and how the individual participate on them. So um, I was saying, uh, um, in this example, the white supremacy is the, is the um, kind of uh, signifier one. Mm -hmm. um, this course relates to both the representation, which is this axis, uh -huh. yes, this one, and production, this one. But this A that I am showing here, it remains um, opaque. I will explain a little bit uh, more what I mean by that. The way the formula works is this al algebraic uh, formula that, by which Lacan attempts to articulate his work in the most succinct way is that the subject, the black man bird watcher, um, who was caring to leash her dog, the, her dog uh, causes a master signifier, white supremacy embodied by Karen, or this woman, Amy, or, well, in the, you know what I mean, uh, to address knowledge, which is the police, 
uh, from this operation, there's a, a residue, um, a br the brutality, a traumatic residue uh, that is the brutality against black men in general. This example, the events separated in temporal spatial, in temporal spatial gap, demonstrates the intrinsic bonding of individuals and systems, in this case, around a white supremacy master signifier. So when I am talking about the master signifier in my paper, it's not so much to talk about the, the, the far right or the alt right or whatever, but more to bring it as an imminent critique of what happens in the left. What happens with, uh, with uh, this uh, uh, kind of uh, apodictic necessity uh, that, that uh, I call apodictic necessity because the master signifier is a structural necessity because it helps us to signify oral further signification. For example, in the, in the case that we are um, kind of analyzing or that I brought, um, it, the signifier one, the white supremacy, um, uh, it kind of uh, secures or further signification. For example, the conservative media um, deploys discursive strategies. For example, they, they use all sorts of information to cloud the reputation of the victim to secure the signification that black men owe to die. But the master signifier is a condition of language. And that's my critique is how this work within the left, as I was mentioning. For example, Tamir Bar-On uh, last Friday mentioned a good example. He was saying that uh, when he uh, teaches some areas of study that uh, uh, inquires fascist thought, people ask him if he's a fascist, right? This sort of um, uh, lack of uh, um, kind of uh, critical a thought when we um, identify fully with the master signifier that is being repeated. So I critique a whole branch in my paper of left politics focusing on policy, those that focus in, are focusing on, on policing statements that relate to identitarian qualities. While these uh, call our cultures are important to legitimize the struggles for recognition and equality, many times the movement regresses into inflammatory and puritanical demands, um, the imaginary order, occluding the more crucial material forces that shape our world. So my point is that the left suffers from this moral superiority that is at the core of this um, a kind of um, signifier one, that uh, yeah keeps repeating, and that is uh, what gives a sort of a, a, a coagulated identity. So the most important part of um, uh, is is to get to the axis of production, right? To change the material forces, to um, bring that uh, opacity um, uh, to the forefront, and to inscribe. And what what do I mean uh, by that? In this, ex in this example, uh, to uh, inscribe the effects of this uh, white supremacy discourse, this atrocious production of unjust deaths, requires to bring uh, an inscription into that, to bring it to the law, in particularly in this case. So uh, um, the the compulsive repetitions of the many Michael Browns, George Lodge, uh, require a limit, require something that the letter grasp and put into a certain uh, legality. Every political instance, I argue, brings about a traumatic residual excess inaccessible to representation, which manifests in the overwhelming emergencies of humanitarian, ecological, sociological, or economic nature. Such residues correspond to the insistence of the dead drive of our late capitalist system, whose dehumanized cause falls harder 
onto the most vulnerable through a sanctioned naturalization of history. By the fact that media and social media are obscenely, obscenely transparent, these events appear as all too visible, readable, and legible, but it doesn't inscribe. It doesn't make this illegal act to stop, just contribute to their desensitization. Moreover, such representation does not in any way involve a cessation of the effects of bare life, human indignment, indign indignity, or puzzlement. Many times, um, also, we, are, we think that the master signifier, like the thing that we believe is the universal. So I engage in the differentiation of uh, the, the um, master signifier and the uni universality, because the universality, uh, I define it there as, as the one to be achieved, as the one that is uh, following, for example, Ranciere call, uh, calls with regards to class, the part of those who have no part. Um, so that's what defines universality and what uh, kind of differentiates from this um, kind of um, uh, mechanism of the master signifier. Um, the racist actors in our example sees the universe as always already the actualization of the ethno-nationalist particularly but particular but the the uh, the negative quality of the universal evidences the crucial difference between uh, the master signifier aspirational universality from its actuality <clears throat> um, going back to the inscription, um, there's uh, one uh, very amazing um, work by Iyal Weisman uh, that is called Cloud Studies. I just tweeted this. Um, it's um, uh, within a larger project that is called Forensic. Arch architecture, um, he presents uh, kind of a dialogue, uh, an object uh, that is obviously the, the effect of a dialogue among many scientists of um, what happens with the clouds that, uh, for example, that um, are caused by um, these um, bombs that are uh, thrown in Gaza, uh, between Israel and Palestine, or in, in Tijuana, or in Turkey, or in, everywhere, the, the kind of the malignant sort of uh, um, uh, weapons that are being imposed on people. And they propose something very interesting. Uh, they call uh, this is forensic without inscription. It is um, something that is there without trace, and that's um, what I think is important um, uh, to, to re recuperate uh, the ways of making that traumatic element to be legible. And, um, and more so in, in, in the times that, that we live with regards to uh, the, the, um, the, the uh, kind of a natural disaster in which we are uh, engaged in these times. So, when a person who has suffered a traumatic event keeps remembering the disturbing content of the trauma, it doesn't necessarily translate as a gain of any relief from their suffering. They have not found yet a, they have not found yet a way to inscribe the destructive insistence as to do away with the traumatic residue. A creative emergence is needed. Many political achievements that I would call are inscriptional are indeed the effect of um, uh, kind of strong uh, fights, strong activism, the gains of human rights, for example, women's uh, vote, homosexual marriage, transsexual and intersexual, um, intersexuality recognition. All of those are ways of uh, inscribing something of this thing that keeps repeating. <clears throat> 
the delicate process of inscription, a temporal, temporal cessation of the insistence of the traumatic and reinscription, the, the emergence of a new embodied signification in the clinic demand from the analyst that they bear the anxiety of the traumatic, holding the space for its unfolding and resignification through silences and interventions and to acknowledge negativity, which we automatically deny at the level of the social. I argue that in a civic society, this is the function of the intellectual who comes to occupy the function of the analyst in the process of inscribing the residue of the real. The actualization of what is possible to change in analysis occurs in the context of transference, which is to say, within a field of trust, by the position of, of the analyst outside the rival imaginary condition. Could the intellectual bear that responsibility? And then I argue the intellectual should become an analyst, a militant leader, a Gramscian efficacious instrument on counter hegemony. The responsibility of the intellectual analyst thus consists in an epistemological unsetting, unsettling of their immediate world while accounting for their own unconscious through an act that creates possibilities in their social milieu. Obviously, I'm asking a lot here, right? I'm asking a lot because it requires a profound um, a, a exploration of that metaphysical knavery uh, that Lacan talks about uh, the left, the moral superiority, the rivalries between disciplines, the rivalries between um, colleagues, um, the, 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 the responsibility of the intellectual is akin to the Kantian Munchheit in the way Adorno discusses it as the maturity to speak for oneself in an intimate way or life contact with the warmth of things. Yet in a Lacanian twist, it is about the ability to think for oneself with others in presence of the unconscious. Such an intellectual is required to produce their own master signifier, only possible through an examination of its own unconscious limits and narcissistic enjoyments. When the master signifier is produced rather than imposed from without, it becomes less absolute less rigid, less exclusive and, exclusive and totalitarian, renouncing any will of mastery because it is aware of its own limit. The world produces lots of culture. Post-pandemia, we are suffocated with the proliferations of symbolic endeavors. So much is being everywhere. So much talent and thought. We need, however, as Johann Hartel poses in chapter 15 of this um, uh, spectre of fascism, go beyond the liberal spectacle of culture. We need to transform the material conditions and the social relationships that sustains it and that requires some militancy. I propose that this should be conducted in the institution. The responsibility of the intellectual from a psychoanalytic perspective then consists not in becoming the caudillo of a social totality, but a leader who reads possibility and grasps the suitability with clear and audacious desire to transform the dramas of the couple, family, workplace, or social group as the very site of their struggle. I'm concluding here. The political act which acknowledges the impossibility of accounting for the universal requires a not all approach. The not all is found on the feminine side, but different from, um, for example, the perspective of Laura, um, psychoanalysis, Lacanian psychoanalysis do not essentialize uh, woman, men uh, based on anatomy, but rather a certain position with regards to enjoyment and with regards to the law. So 
they're not all of uh, find in found in the side of the feminine is not to be understood as anatomic, but rather as a position taken with regards to the incompleteness of the symbolic field. And not all approach is what the left needs today. Warm instead of cold, wet instead of dry, flexible instead of rigid, addressing a structure rather than appearance, open to the awareness of subjective di division and on the side of the impossibility, not on the impotence. And I'm gonna leave it there and then I can talk about the pandemia and what I think um, it's, from my perspective, at stake, the social bond, by the way. Thanks very much, Hilda. Um, so I'm now going to speak. Uh, I'm trying to keep it to about 15 minutes, so we have uh, time in um, at the end for discussion. Um, and I would also just like to to mention uh, that I think Hilda, you had um, uh, George Lloyd up uh, as the name of of the, the man who was recently uh, executed by the police. It was George Floyd. I think it's important to to get the the, the name right. Okay. Uh, so, I say Lloyd and it's Floyd. Yeah, it was on one of the slides. Okay, thank you, thank you. For correction, um, these things uh, obviously happen. Um, so what I'd like to do is spend uh, a little bit of time just sort of outlining the arguments um, of my uh, contribution, my own chapter. I spoke a little bit about my introduction uh, last week, um, so I'd just like to talk uh, a bit about my, uh, my chapter and then try and link it to the, the following panel next week, um, and I note that Ajay Gudavati is speaking first on that panel, and um, in fact, I think there's a, an interesting connection between some of the arguments in my contribution to this book and um, uh, his book, from which he draws um, for his chapter, but his book, uh, India After Modi. Um, and I think that one of the key things that I've wanted to uh, keep in mind in framing uh, the book and also in, in my chapter is the importance of grounding an analysis of fascism in a critical um, understanding of, of capitalism. I think we, we really uh, need to um, make sure that that is a, a, a crucial dimension of, of, of our analysis. And the way I, I propose to do this is really through um, a reading of Adorno's uh, for in the pattern of fascist propaganda, which was published uh, one year after um, the publication of the Authoritarian Personality, and that was in 1951. Um, and this uh, text, I think, is, is, is really quite important insofar as um, it uh, it raises uh, questions, I think, about the, the nature of the investment that, that we see in uh, particular um, strongman uh, uh, type leaders. Uh, I think Am's point is very well taken that we ought not to um, we ought not to conflate uh, or or uh, reduce uh, these figures to the same sort of phenomenon. But I think we can try and discern a, a kind of logic um, that leads to their 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 pre preeminence today uh, globally. And again, that's a really important focus of the book that it's a it's a global focus. I think also keeping our eye on the question of Capitalism is really uh, key insofar as we can then detect between fascisms, right? Obviously, there's a form of fascism that is overt and direct and, and, and manifesting itself um, ever more um, clearly today in the form of, you know, the neo-Nazi organizations, the Ku Klux Klan, um, and, and various other uh, kindred uh, organizations. And those um, organizations must be uh, challenged very directly and clearly. But then there's this more general uh, sense of, uh, of, of fascism that, uh, that Foucault talks about in his preface to Anti-Oedipus, and it's a, you know, it's a sort of fascism that resides in all of us. Now, if fascism is that particular, uh, uh, both uh, political movement and organizational structure and, and state form that emerges uh, in the context of a crisis of capitalism, um, it also has its own psychological and structure, and, and, and it is a structure of subjectivity more generally. And insofar as that's related to the, um, the emergence um, and deepening of, uh, of uh, value form, uh, it is then something that can be understood as coterminous with it, and not just localizable in a political 
uh, form a state form uh, a, um, um, a, a, a political movement on the ground and so on so we have to think about the kind of fascism that resides in us all and this has been something I've been thinking about in terms of um, and and this is echoed in 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 Hilda's presentation um, various forms of um, uh, identity politics which uh, have a very strong authoritarian core uh, and within these uh, movements uh, there's often what uh, goes on is a collective identification is such a, a uh, an easy use uh, of the term fascism simply to name um, our uh, our enemies those that we disagree with those who don't use language correctly um, and and so on um, and I think that this is uh, a mistake on a number of uh, a number of fronts not least um, it makes it very difficult to identify those who really represent um, a, a kind of threat to us all in tandem with the state uh, um, uh, security apparatuses, the police, and the na in the United States, the National Guard, the military. These things are um, uh, then become kind of difficult to to name and and combat. So those are some preliminary uh, thoughts. Um, essentially, the uh, the essay that I address, uh, Freudian theory and the pattern of uh, fascist propaganda, itself is engaged uh, with a number of different texts. Um, there's Freud's group psychology and the analysis of the ego. Um, there's Eric Fromm, that was published in uh, 1922. Um, there's Eric Fromm's Escape from Freedom, uh, published in 1941, that Ingo Schmidt uh, mentioned last, uh, last week. Prophets of Deceit by Lewenthal and Gutmann, published in 1949. And uh, most importantly, Dialectic of Enlightenment, uh, published in 1944, uh, whose um, elements of anti-Semitism chapter forms the uh, theoretical background uh, for the um, uh, project for the book, very important uh, book, uh, The Authoritarian Personality, which, as, as I think I alluded to, was published in 1950. Um, Dialectic Enlightenment is of particular importance here um, because it's uh, the text in which Adorno, along with uh, Horkheimer, show the way in which the modern form of subjectivity is fundamentally self-sacrificial. Um, they take uh, Odysseus and they provide a, uh, quite a virtuosic reading uh, of the Odyssey. They take um, Odysseus as the first bourgeois, we could say today, the, the first neoliberal perhaps, um, and make the argument that rather than being opposed, myth and enlightenment are uh, deeply intertwined. Um, the key difference, though, is that under conditions of myth, um, the, the drive to uh, self-preservation, to survival, um, is based on external sacrifices to the gods, whereas enlightenment entails the progressive internalization or introjection of sacrifice. And this then also I mean, resonates with Freud's critical understanding of civilization. Um, and they argue that, uh, such self-sacrifice, such um, violence that, that one has to do uh, to oneself to survive um, is ultimately directed uh, by fascism um, uh, outwards against um, uh, the uh, defined enemies. And um, obviously spoke uh, to, 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 uh, uh, to this at, at, at some length. Um, so historically it was the Jews. Today, uh, Jews remem remain a uh, uh, the, uh, the enemy and target uh, for uh, fascist uh, propaganda. But of course, also, as Am also mentioned, um, uh, Mexicans, uh, uh, refugees, migrants, um, uh, obviously people of color, the homeless, these are all now uh, new forms of um, uh, uh, um, uh, enmity, I would say. That these, are, these are the new enemies of, of the contemporary period. So, what uh, Adorno does in uh, fascist uh, uh, in the in the uh, fascist propaganda essay is to take the uh, typology that was set by Gutmann and Lumenthal of the, ref the, the the three responses to um, social crises: uh, reformer, the uh, revolutionary, and the agitator, and um, suggest how the reformer and uh, and the revolutionaries have analyses of uh, the nature of the crises and ways through the crisis. 
um, uh, and the uh, agitator, on the other hand, um, doesn't. Simply takes the uh, the um, negative affects that are generated in a crisis and seeks to deepen them. Uh, and this is the way in which the agitative people, uh, figures like Father Coughlin in the in the past, uh, or Donald Trump today, or Narendra Modi, um, use those affects to generate political uh, support, and they do so by constituting uh, the enemy who is uh, taken to be responsible for the crisis. Um, but one of the things that uh, uh, Adorno argues in this essay is that there isn't enough of an understanding of the precise way in which um, the uh, agitator is able to um, uh, capture, in a sense, the, the, the negative aspects of the uh, of, of the followers, and he uses Freud's uh, group psychology to understand this, and it has to do with the kind of uh, the the uh, development of a, a social bond based on libidinal investment that's mediated by the um, uh, the uh, leader himself, and the argument is um, essentially that uh, the um, the very self sacrificial form of subjectivity, a form of self-sacrifice that we're seeing uh, ever more visible today in the condition of the pandemic, uh, lead to frustration, anger, and rage. Um, and, you know, lying at the center of this is an analysis of, of capitalism, that on the, one hand, on the one hand, modernity entails that the individual is responsible for her fate, you can see under neoliberalism, especially responsible you know, as, as a word that I don't like um, uh, uh, suggests, um, responsible eyes, sort of made responsible, have, has, in a sense, had uh, the various um, uh, forms of care, uh, various forms of um, entitlement, and, and, and so on, constituted by the welfare state downloaded uh, onto them. Um, onto onto their shoulders, so there's more responsibility that the individual has, uh, but then the individual is subjected to ever more um, heteronomy, given the um, uh, the uh, further unleashing of the logic of blind domination, which uh, has to do with the role of market forces in uh, in one's life. So this exacerbates the condition, and it leads individuals to constantly fall short of. Uh, their uh, ego ideals to deal with this inner connection, inner contradiction. They identify with the aggressor, who is an inflated image or spectacle, one could say, uh, of themselves. This is, as Adorno puts it, a composite uh, of King Kong and a suburban barber. One thinks here uh, immediately of figures like Boris Johnson and, and Donald Trump. Um, one could say, well, yeah, that, that might uh, actually hold for. Um, the Western uh, world, it might hold for the global uh, north, but but what about um, the global south? And I think you can see um, a, a similar kind of logic at play um, in the global south, in particular uh, in India. And I just want to turn to a couple of um, arguments uh, of um, uh, made by Ajay Gudavarti in his book, India After uh, uh, Modi. So Gudavarti points out how the middle class in the West came into its own in a period of relative stability and security uh, in the aftermath of the Second World War. As a consequence, it was able to play a moderating role between working class demands from uh, below and the bourgeoisie um, uh, uh, from above. This was the age of social citizenship. The Indian middle class, in contrast, arose precisely under conditions of insecurity in which the social bond was replaced by a precarious uh, contractual or, or transactional relationship. And this is what um, Marx and Engels, this is my gloss on it, um, in the Communist Manifesto, uh, uh, referred to as the callous cash payment, and which could therefore be broken off at any point. Such pervasive and constitutive insecurity makes the individual, it makes the um, Indian middle class uniquely susceptible to the attractions of Hindu uh, communalism, which is nonetheless articulated in a way that makes it uniquely attractive to this class. As Gudavarti argues, and I quote, the right is encroached on the discourse of equality, dignity, recognition, and representation, 
not its typical ter terrain, but, uh, and has sutured them to the ideas of unity, nationalism, loyalty, and order. If, as alluded to above, the return of authoritarian politics is about the return of the leaders who purport to embody in muscular fashion the will of the people, um, in the US, US, obviously, the figure of Donald Trump, um, in the UK, Boris Johnson, or Viktor Orban in Hungary, and uh, Yair uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil, then such a return leaves no doubt, if any indeed existed, about Modi's authoritarian credentials. Modi is a quintessentially strong man figure who symbolizes the regained pride of a nation that imagines itself as historically downtrodden and hard done by it at the hands of successive oppressors. The claim to victimhood here is one that the Nazis, of course, zealously uh, embraced. And um, as I've already suggested, the work of uh, Theodore Adorno um, uh, um, can help us understand how contemporary authoritarian leaders can be regarded as great little men in which authoritarian personalities are able to identify enlarged images of themselves. So they're both like us, but also um, uh, not like us at the same time, according to um, the followers of, of, these, uh, of these figures. So there's a contradiction, and I think this is really the key point that I want to make, the contradiction between democratic equality and liberal freedom, the, the, the contradiction built into um, uh, capitalist modernity. As this contradiction deepens and as individuals find it increasingly to live up to their ego ideals, um, they look to such punitive father figures who function as enlarged versions of themselves as a way of addressing this gap or shortcoming and a way of dealing with the frustration, fear, and anger that comes with it. As Gudavardi writes, although from a humble background, Prime Minister Modi now leads a life of power and ostentatiousness, which prompted Rahul Gandhi to refer to Mr. Modi's rule as Sutbut Ki Sarkar, Modi claims the legacy of the poor and the marginalized based on his past and the power of the rich and the corporate and, and, and the corporation based on his current stature. This symbolizes the journey of a self-made man and at another level justifies aggressive corporate growth and lifestyle. He attempts to forge continuity, not a, dis not a dichotomy between the two, end quote. So Mr. Modi fits this description perfectly insofar as on the one hand, he cultivates the populist image of the lower, lower castes that conveniently, as Gudavardi indicates, insulates him from the charge that he is insufficiently refined for the position of prime minister. On the other hand, much is made of his supposedly 56 in, in uh, chest. Um, Modi is what Adorno calls the composite of the suburban barber and King Kong. Gudavardi writes, however, he is also a chaiwala, a das or servant, and a chaudikar who is working against the establishment representing the interests of the people. This idea of the people, however, is selective, sectarian, and refers to an authentic core that stands with, not against the leader. My timer. Um, outside the fold of this authentic constituency, the leader is not expected to extend similar humility, but contrarily is understood to be strong, intolerant, and ruthless. This composite character mirror, mirrors exactly the inherent contradiction of capitalism, manifestly exacerbated in its accelerated neoliberal form. It is for this reason that at this historical moment, with the consolidation of neoliberalism across the globe for some two decades, we see the strongman phenomenon as ubiquitous. It results from the very same contradiction that Gudavarti puts his finger on, um, and in light of which Modi's re-election in 2019 was not in re retrospect particularly su surprising. I'm going to end uh, on, this, uh, on this quote, um, give the last uh, word to uh, uh, Ajay. Um, this unique historical moment has been one where the formal reach of the political discourse of equality, dignity, recognition, and representation has spread to all quarters and sections of human society, while the conditions to realize them have become cumulatively contained and dissipated. So this is the, the, the fundamental contradiction, I think, to which the rise of um, uh, authoritarianism, or let's say the return of the specter of fascism, um, 
um, it must be understood in the context of. So uh, thank you very much and uh, welcome your, your questions. I'm gonna just take a look uh, right now. Okay, so um, we have a question from Judith uh, Frederica Hopp to all the panelists and, um, and attendees. I'm gonna uh, read it out. Um, in order to bring together the roles of the intellectual and the analyst, the intellectual has to truly reflect her understanding of theory and practice. And based on my experience with philosophy, this is no easy task. Another way, another way to put this is, um, I'm not sure if the philosopher or the intellectual is ready to question herself in her thinking practice like the analyst has to do, has to do in her clinical practice. It's a very interesting question. Um, I'll, I'll open it up to the panel, but first to uh, Hilda. This is really, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, um, Ju Judy. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a big problem, right? Uh, it's... Um, it's, uh, there are two aspects, uh, the importance of the practice, right? The, the bringing philosophy as a practice at core with uh, a practice that includes the subject, that includes the person who is doing that. It is difficult, yeah, it is difficult and we see it um, in the everyday kind of uh, scholarship of uh, how difficult it is to count oneself because when we count ourselves uh, as as uh, kind of suffering of the same human condition uh, the, the uh, kind of uh, subjected to language and that kind of thing I think that's uh, that's uh, uh, ho the horizon as as impossible as it is I think that uh, we need to aim uh, towards that uh, that horizon. Otherwise, we do a lot of very nice uh, talks and very nice uh, papers, and we are uh, full of these sort of uh, productions. But um, yeah, we need to uh, act more in in practice. No. If, if I could just make a quick comment and then uh, turn it over to Laura and 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 Dan. Um, just, you know, uh, something that, that uh, happened about a year ago, um, and I posted on Facebook something like, um, analytical philosophy is the scarcely disguised impulse to aggression. And immediately I had somebody uh, responding to that, define aggression. That's <laughs> My point, exactly. So, Laura. Uh, well, it's, uh, it's certainly a good um, challenge to uh, people who, who do philosophy to put their philosophy into practice. And um, you know, I, I would simply say that uh, the kind of philosophy that I try to do is an embodied philosophy, and it brings brings that kind of risk with it. Um, but I think it also brings the reward of um, helping to avoid um, disembodiment and um, uh, you know, false consciousness, to use an old fashioned term. Okay. Yeah, the, body, the body key, right? Uh, I was going to say there's a, a lot we uh, place on to uh, philosophy. You know, there's the, the, the recent pile on, on Agumbin. Our philosophers become dotards too at times, despite uh, producing uh, a, a good work. In, in uh, 1968 in France, Agumbin took a, a seminar uh, with Heidegger in, and based on uh, uh, being uh, uh, so disrupted by that, you know, turned to uh, Benjamin and others, and uh, you do see um, these kind of responses to intellectual thought happening. And how do we uh, take the position of the of the analyst and be embodied at the same time? I think this has always constantly been uh, the challenge of of philosophy. Yeah, um, I was just on a panel. I was moderating a panel for for Red May, and and uh, Agamben came up in his his equation of uh, college professors who. 
who do online teaching um, with German university professors who signed the 1931 loyalty oath was very mm -hmm. of Heidegger's reductionisms, like when he you know reduces um, the uh, the product mass production of uh, of corpses in the camp to mechanized agriculture. I mean, it, it it's really quite astounding, you know, the these this, the lack of judgment uh, amongst people who who did actually have um, <laughs> have a slightly better sense. Of, of, of judgment. Um, all right, so I'll go to some more questions. Um, uh, okay, well, there, there's a question uh, for me, which I'll uh, I'll address, but I'll, I'll open it up as well. I think this also uh, I think could could relate to um, uh, to each of us panelists. Uh, is uh, isn't the contention that fascism exists in all of us an example of a very practiced um, of what you have criticized, the indigitious, indigitious, I can't say that word right now, um, the uh, labeling of what we like and, and disagree with um, as fascist. I think, I think this is the, the really good question. Uh, but what I wanted to say is I think we really need to ward against locating the problem always elsewhere. And if we do take seriously that fascism emerges, again, uh, as a form of subjectivity, not just a, you know, a, a political ideology or a set of organizational structures or, or really a state form, then um, it, it becomes more more difficult. And it's, it's related to um, to the kinds of violence that we must do to ourselves, each of us, um, to survive. Uh, then there is uh, fascist potential, at least. Um, in uh, in all of us, and I think we, we need to be um, uh, attentive to that. And I, I, that's how I take Foucault's um, preface. That's the spirit in which I take the anti to anti Oedipus. I don't know if people also want to come in. It relates to the pr the previous question as well. I think. Yeah, the we all have uh, a little bit of what Bataille called the accursed share. We carry with us uh, hate and death, uh, the drive and uh, all sorts of the things that we see in extreme uh, ways in the, in the world, no? like uh, that destructivity. Life itself uh, has this... this uh, infinite surplus that can lead to destruction so the the the, the kind of main uh, venues is like you kind of become a masochistic or you impose on to on to others like a, kind of the main this is in vicissitudes of the drives according to to uh, freud so it's it's how do we engage sublimation how do we engage creation how how do we transform that um, hate into something that allows us to not be a masochist, but not being a uh, freaking racist. Well, I'd like to uh, just speak back to that because, um, and I, I have, uh, Hilda, I've got great respect for your way you renew uh, Lacanian psychoanalytic theory, um, but uh, personally in my intellectual journey, um, I had to, when I recognized that the position I am embracing is um, masochism. Oh, do I need to, uh, I'm going to, um, when I recognize that the position I'm embracing uh, is masochism in terms of psychoanalytic theory, that's when I, I took a shift toward um, uh, psychoanalysis um, and other forms of psychoanalysis that do not uh, frame desire as lack. Uh, it's, I shouldn't be bringing up such a huge topic at the very end of our time, um, but I'm actually, um, within the Lacanian framework, I, I would be an advocate for masochism as perhaps destructive only of a self that we did not need in the first place or that was illusory. Oh. Hmm. Interesting. Um, would you like to reply to that, Hilda, and then move to, to Anne? Um, yes, uh, with regards to the lack. Uh, yeah, I know that uh, a lot of uh, the issues that um, 
kind of come uh, from a lot of feminist readings of Lacan, particularly. It's the early kind of wave of uh, feminism uh, that uh, kind of it, it maybe didn't grasp fully the 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 lack of essentialism in this in this uh, theory of sexuation, and um, and in terms of desire, in as as lack, um, I always think that uh, if we are complete, then what we are gonna desire, we need a space. We need a little bit of space. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if we are saturated, um, which is a problem of now that I'm seeing uh, in, in terms of the, the virtual, right? We are so saturated, um, yeah, kind of, of many things, uh, more so now that we are Zooming everywhere. So, uh, yeah, if there's no lack, if there's no space, how we are going to produce something to, to create that is not there? It would be just my short answer. Yeah, I, can I just speak that quickly? I, I think that's really beautiful. But I, I think we could still think of that space, that empty space, as not a void, but as a, a virtuality or a potentiality. Right, right. Um, did you want to come in? or? Yeah, I'm just going to speak a little bit to uh, the complicated nature of constructing affirmative uh, political community in times of distress, uh, who is one's friends, uh, how to build a community, how to build comrades, how to uh, build up movements, the question of organization and uh, duration. These are, these are things that have been long thought about in, uh, amongst the progressive left. I, I think that the challenge comes in is that when we start to present our political uh, subjectivity uh, in response to the enemy, uh, that when we organize simply because we have the enemy, rather from an alternative uh, point of view where we make the cut to draw lines. Uh, lines are always drawn in, in, in politics, but uh, a construction of identity built around the enemy can reproduce uh, the centralized uh, responses to that type of politics that can become a kind of pathology in, mm -hmm. in leftist movements. Mm -hmm. Exactly. At the same time, though, one of the, the, the more successful movements in, in the United States and, and certainly in, in, in the UK, both of which are, are now in their denouement, which is to say the, um, the, the moment of, of Sanders and the moment of Corbyn, um, were um, political moments that entailed a certain kind of redefinition of, uh, of enmity, right? So it's um, for the many and not the few. Mm -hmm. um, there is a kind of discourse of um, the uh, one percent versus the ninety-nine, and and do you have a kind of clarity after a long period in which the left seemed quite um, quite aimless uh, and was in a, a period of uh, of real um, a, a real decline? There's been a real kind of renewal of at least the language of socialism in the United States, and I think that's quite quite extraordinary. But it has been through a certain definition of the enemy, which seemed to be noticeably absent during... Um, during I, I, I agree with you uh, very much, Samir, but I would argue that what uh, Corbyn was putting forward or the Sanders movement and other uh, movements is actually an affirmative uh, construction is where it begins from, and, and the, the definition and drawing of lines happens after. Right. Good. Well... Let's, uh, let's follow up with a, another question to you, and there's uh, one that's just arrived. Um, Am you speak of the state of ex exception has already become the rule. How to reverse this um, handing over of power um, by society individuals? Well, I, I think just as we were, we were speaking about it, it requires affirmative uh, political construction uh, that have the capacity for organization and duration and also the building up of institutions that can uh, uh, create when uh, that can that can create that possibility and when we leave it in the hands of parliamentary politics or political parties it limits our field of choice and oftentimes the train of battles has happened it doesn't mean that the state is taken out as a site of uh, possibility uh, 
yeah. but that it comes after the fact of these affirmative uh, political constructions. And I, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's sort of the, the Badouin notion of the, trying to build the possibility of the possibility of something new. Right, right. So, um, I mean, one of the things you see in, in both of those mo both of those moments, as well as in Spain uh, with Podemos and its relationship to the indignados, is you have social movements that are then feeding into sort of parliamentary politics. And as they're kind of based, you have Momentum, you have Occupy in the States and indignados in, in, in Spain. Yeah, yeah, there are two uh, questions that uh, I I think that they are addressing my presentation and I would like to put them together. Um, uh, Shruti, Shruti, I see an intrinsic contradiction when you hint at the identitarian left. Sounds like an argument of the neoliberal narrative today that seemingly speaks for every minority group. The younger Modi government leaders speak that language of correctness. The master signifier, you say, is not universal, but it also seems to lack a center, as Zizek would put it. And then um, a specter of fascism uh, kind of questions. Ilda speaks of the intellectual as producing their own master. How can this be used for positive social change rather than what we see today with master discourse in the U.S.? So, uh, yeah, I agree with uh, what um, Shruti uh, presented there. Yeah, I indeed, um, uh, the, the issue with the master signifier, what, when it becomes uh, an assimilation in which we um, kind of... Uh, um, kind of hinge our own identity uh, kind of as being imposed uh, from the outside. You are someone of the left that need to uh, kind of uh, contest every instance of um, misogyny, um, um, I don't know, homophobia, racism, etc. Those are important, important aspects. But sometimes it's such a um, zealotness that it prevents dialogue. It, it just it obscures the the nuances of uh, of the situation. So how to produce our own master? That's that's kind of a process of analysis in an in, kind of in an individual. Um, kind of process of uh, clinical, but it has to do with, um, number one, uh, assuming that there's not a totality, and number two, uh, in a practice that, that it is um, uh, embodied, that it, it has to do with, um, with uh, um, kind of an, an intervention of, um, of uh, criticality in, in where you are. And this is something, I, I don't know how to think it in the totality uh, in terms of the big political kind of words or movements, but I see it in the institution. Uh, for example, with regards to the Vancouver Coastal Health, uh, my, my practice uh, there, my research, uh, I'm bringing the evidence-based uh, practices that are used in medicine and that are fundamental and important in medicine, how it is um, translated into psychology no? or into psychiatry. And then it's kind of bringing that element of uh, uh, all knowing, all mastery that is hindering really the humanity that is bringing death to the institution. So I see it more in a shorter kind of uh, a group or a, a way of uh, disrupting that sort of emergence. So I, I'd like to take a, um, a question now that has to do with Brazil and this will get us thinking a little bit about um, our panel for next, uh, uh, next Friday. Um, very interesting question in Brazil, we are living an, Im an imminent coup d'etat, uh, Bolsonaro said yesterday that he had, had enough of leftist media and investigations about his son on fake news scandals, etc. Um, how could this be related to the, we have had enough from Minneapolis? Uh, I think our Brazilian fascists are losing a narrative of self-renunciation that elected Bolsonaro, but in, this, in the same time it leads inevitably to a uh, coup. Um, maybe a contradiction between um, uh, competing, perhaps, uh, narcissistic impulses. Well, I'd, I'd just like to get started on this uh, to some extent, and, and that is, um, yeah, perhaps there is a kind of limit to self-renunciation here, uh, but I imagine amongst his core supporters, and this is something that uh, Adorno raised in his lecture that was recently published 
um, about uh, well close to it was about a year ago now um, on the um, uh, the uh, uh, new aspects of the of the far right. Um, it was a lecture that he gave to uh, a students group at the University of uh, Vienna in uh, I think it was sixty seven or so, um, and that uh, he saw. Within the the rise of the 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 uh, the, 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 the new far right, um, a kind of uh, clearly defined nihilistic um, uh, uh, core, which of course was there in um, in the fascism of the uh, of the interwar period, um, but you see this especially today in our condition of uh, of, uh, uh, of global ecological catastrophe. You have uh, regimes like uh, Bolsonaro's and and Trump's um, and Modi's, amongst others, not doing anything uh, to address the ecological crisis, but in fact seem to want to accelerate it. There's almost a kind of embrace of death. It is a kind of fanatopolitics, a politics geared to the achievement of nothing but death. And so, of course, there will be, I think, those uh, followers of figures like Bolsonaro who, who will turn away from this. Um, but I think that the, there's still going to be a hardcore who will follow him through thick and thin, who, who will um, uh, give them, uh, you know, give, will be prepared to give their lives uh, for uh, this figure. And you see this in the anti-lockdown protests as well. These are people who are putting themselves at severe risk uh, of uh, contracting the, the virus and, and therefore also um, of, of dying. And, and, and many have already. So I think this is what we're, you know, what we're faced with. Um, I think one of the, the phenomena I, I'd throw out as well is it's important to remember that um, uh, these types of authoritarian populisms don't uh, come in a vacuum. There is a lack of functioning in society and the, and the body politic that, that uh, despite the gerrymandering and voter suppression in each uh, context, uh, Modi won the election, so did Erdogan, so did, uh, 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 so did Viktor Orban uh, in, in, in Brazil and, and, and Trump as well. And so there's something also about the construction of a progressive leftist project that's missing the mark in uh, expressing uh, uh, the politics of people who have been marginalized, left out of the political space itself. And so it, it's, it, and, and these people aren't just getting elected once, when they flout the constitution, they become more popular, they get reelected. And so I think it's something about reading into the political moment of how does a progressive left intervene in the space that's been uh, created in this country. You have to remember the opposition to Orban in Hungary is to his right. The left is so weak, they're not even the primary opposition in Hungary. Uh, but it's such a crucial point, Amin. It ties into our discussion uh, with, uh, with Hilda about identitarian politics. Um, and and it, it resonates with some of the things that I was saying too, insofar as um, what has happened in the, the uh, ascendancy of neoliberalism, uh, the idea of capitalist realism has you know, descended, which is there is no alternative. And one reason that there's no alternative is that the left repositioned itself in terms of a, a modus vivandi with uh, uh, neoliberal capitalism and burnished its progressive credentials, so to speak, um, in terms of a politics of identity and inclusion. So it becomes a kind of multiculturalism that is what distinguishes the left from uh, the uh, right. And so those who may have been attracted to a left uh, politics against inequality uh, are now um, alienated, doubly alienated, by a lack of a program to address inequality and then also um, a, 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 a politics that seems to be, in fact, in some cases is, eroding their privilege. And, and that then becomes a combustible um, a recipe for the um, uh, consolidation of the parliamentary far right. I mean, the Republican Party is not just a, a conservative party. It's a far right party now, as you were alluding to, Anne. But then outside of it, you have even... Uh, sort of uh, organizations and groups that even much further uh, to uh, to the right, and that's that's what we're faced with today. And and I think that this is how we can read um, both the rise and the fall of 
moments like uh, Corbyn and, and Sanders mm -hmm. for auguring, I think, a much worse situation going forward because you don't even have that kind of um, leftist politics uh, anymore. Um, it's all ab about the politics of identity. And this is a, a dangerous time for that reason. Hilda, um, Laura? Uh, yeah, I want to say um, something related to this um, and also related to a discussion that uh, that we were having in the, uh, the Q&A, which is, um, I think another movement that we can bring in um, that is a shift away from the politics of identity and unify the left is the environmental movement. Um, can you hear me fine? Yep. Okay, I'm hearing some feedback. Uh, insofar as the environmental movement isn't, um, it is related to our common um, mortality and physicality with that of the planet. In a way, the environmental movement makes this question that I was talking about before of the, uh, the, the fiction of the, the um, uh, impenetrable ego, you know, it makes it seem just very, very antiquated. Uh, now, you know, anybody who needs to get on board with... Oh, we just lost you. Oh, uh, um, can you hear me now? Yeah, so you're just saying uh, whoever needs to get on board? Uh, with, the, with the environmental movement, there's a, there's a really fundamental solidarity there, not only with, um, with other humans, but with all you know, living and non-living beings in terms of our physicality and the finiteness and finiteness. Right. Um, if, if I could just respond to that, though, I mean, be, because of, of, of that connection um, and, and it's, you know, w what's entailed in that connection is also a, a sense of, uh, of, of mortality. One can then see exactly the knee-jerk um, uh, rejection uh, of anything to do with uh, the environmental movement. It goes far beyond, you know, we need our, our, our jobs uh, um, saved in the, in, in, in the tar sands. Uh, I mean, I think that, that one, that argument's sort of dead and gone now, given the, the, the situation. But you could, you could say, well, it, you know, it's about jobs and so on. It's about livelihood. Yes, right, okay, at, at that level, it, it, you know, it's, it's something to, to consider. And then we have to talk about transition and retraining and so on. But it goes far beyond that, doesn't it? If, if you, you, you frame it in the, in the terms that you were discussing it in you know at the beginning when you were sort of outlining your your um, your chapter, then then we really have a problem in so far as what is is more of a reminder of of our own uh, uh, mortality as uh, as as individuals and really as a let's say possibly as a species and the the the, the global environmental or ecological catastrophe. Mm -hmm. So you have. A, a, a kind of armorization against this. I, I don't want to know about it at all because it, you know, it um, it threatens me at such a deep level. Yeah, yeah, and 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 that is uh, also mm. part of the. Well, the I can I say a, Oh, sorry, Laura. Uh, oh, yeah. Let, let me say a little thing because it's actually um, uh, referring to what you were talking about earlier, Hilda, which is, um, you know, if uh, if there is to be a. a slow um, re-inscription of the master discourse. Uh, and that, that is happening in a lot of ways. I mean, this is part of what, what culture does. You know, think of uh, science fiction, think of a lot of popular um, television shows that are allowing people to deal with these, um, these most terrifying fantasies. Uh, of our uh, our mutual destruction, um, so I, I think I, I think that that um, the chain you know for sure a lot of people are just uh, armoring themselves even more. But I, I think that um, uh, these fears about what we are doing to each other and the planet and how it will end um, are reshaping human culture. Uh, in a way, and, and even reshaping what Hilda refers to as the master discourse. 
Sorry for my interruption. No, 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 no worries. No worries. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, uh, what I wanted to um, say is that um, uh, in uh, post pandemia no post pandemia we are uh, facing something that um i am particularly worried with regards to alterity and the social bond when we are in the virtual i mean we are losing some some uh, communities we are losing the classrooms we are losing workplaces we are losing the concerts um those uh, kind of uh, elements that that used to bring the body, right? And there's some difference that in our relationship with others when we are body to body when, than when we are in the virtual. Mm -hmm. In the virtual, we can hide very easily, no? And it's, it's a, very, a very good thing in many ways, no? Like uh, uh, we, we can uh, curate who do we um, see and who do we hear. But when we are out there in the community, those things of the alterity requires some response that we are losing at the moment. And, and I think that that goes um, kind of uh, alongside two things. One, that we need, uh, as uh, Astra Taylor, Naomi Klein, and Kianga Jamatha Taylor were talking uh, recently at the beginning of the pandemic about how to um, organi organize digital platforms platforms outside of the financial capital, no? Like how, how do we uh, uh, kind of uh, maintain this, um, let's say, el the erotic body politic that needs to be um, kind of uh, connect to each other, but in a way that is not uh, being serving only the financial capital with all our sentiments and now all our productions. That's one thing. The other is um, kind of return to this uh, concept of the proletarian, but uh, em environmentally laden, right? Like, uh, uh, and, and this uh, sort of... Uh, the what we are the commons that we are losing no the negative commons that the, the i think those are very important in the uh, after the pandemia to sort out the kind of these two aspects that are changing alterity or the way we relate to others mm -hmm. and community. yeah i i wanted to make a kind of uh, an unrelated point which i think one of the the failures of leftist politics is that they haven't properly uh, analyzed and um, uh, uh, taken on uh, the caricature of uh, what is today uh, the kind of the character of the political buffoon. Uh, you know, it's sort of invented in a way by Berlusconi, but it's not surprising that we have somebody like a Trump, a Boris Johnson, um, uh, 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 Bolsonaro in, in Brazil, because it, it really plays off of a hardened politics that plays off of misdirection. It constantly in the news doing more and more outrageous things. And in some sense, the grammar at which uh, the war or power is being adjudicated is, is a different language. And, and how to function and to actually uh, function on that terrain of resistance is something uh, that the left has failed at over and over again. Yeah. yeah, it reminds me of what Jale Mansour was mentioning last uh, Friday about uh, kind of uh, bringing that precisely that uh, uh, kind of uh, opacity in in the kind of the digital or the internet uh, kind of platforms, right? Like to to um, e yeah uh, redefine that discourse that it keeps repeating, repeating. Mm. About that, I'd just like to respond to uh, Laura's comment about uh, the, the kind of new master um, discourse uh, in culture. And I would say it's perhaps a, you know, a new master discourse without any kind of mastery, or it's a, the kind of mastery that the child has in playing the four da game. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 you know, repetition compulsion, um, which doesn't actually, um, uh, at, at the end of the day, um, address the um, the problem. You know, it, it's a way of, uh, in a sense, reassuring ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, that in terms of the, the representation, in terms of discourse, uh, things will be okay. When in fact, um, they just simply aren't. You know, and, yeah, and I, where is that? I, I I don't agree, Samir. Um, I I do agree that uh, representation 
does not change anything. But I do think that um, uh, culture also works uh, on levels prior to representation that actually uh, um, do, do change the psyche and can change the psyche according to, to developing understandings of um, you know, what we believe the world to be. So I mean, I, ha I have to have confidence in that. I do see that happening. It's not going to happen at the level of Uh, you, you cut out again a bit, but I I think unless there are any okay, um, there, I think there's just one one last question that follows from this exchange, and then I think on that uh, I'll I'll go and see if uh, there are any final comments uh, from from the panelists, and then uh, we'll wrap. We're already about twenty six minutes over, um, so. Yeah, the question is, uh, the fourth. yeah, actually, the question was kind of addressed in that, that last exchange, so I, I, I won't close it, but I'll, I'll ask the, um, the other panelists if they have any uh, final thoughts, con concluding remarks, and then uh, we can um, bring things to a close. Hilda? Uh, yeah, we also need to decide what to sacrifice, no? Like, uh desire requires a form of sacrifice we we keep sacrificing what we are forced to sa be a kind of a, what we are forced to sacrifice so i think that um um yeah just just uh, as, as part of a, a kind of bringing a, a master uh, signifier that organizes us it has to involve that thing that we don't want to speak about what we are willing to sacrifice for for change maybe this investment no this investment in in well in this thing that we keep um just uh running around looping looping around no? so mm -hmm. sacrifice is one concept to to okay. have in mind yeah. uh, i'd like to say a little something about um uh, the virtual and the idea that uh, when we meet here um, on this um, video conference platform, we're in the virtual, um, there is a, a physical and um, energetic and human infrastructure that underpins the Zoom platform, the networks, the data centers, the undersea cables, all the people who uh, you know, manufacture, install, and maintain them, and the amount of energy they consume, which is currently about um, at least 7% of the global energy footprint and a corresponding uh, carbon footprint. So, you know, what we are doing here is physical and real. Uh, it may be more difficult to perceive um, the human life and workers that uh, are impacted by what we do online. Um, but uh, we need to treat this as a real physical, material and political space too. So it's got uh, all, the, all those downsides of being real um, and lacking the uh, upside of uh, the sense of touch and smell. That's a really excellent point, and, and not to mention the the, the, the rare uh, minerals uh, that are being mined by children in, in, in Africa to produce um, our various devices, including especially iPhone. Thank you. Um, yeah, just uh, it's been great to be in discussion with all of you, and uh, wonderful that uh, so many people are watching uh, online. And I'll just uh, end with saying, you know, when we're trying to uh, uh, imagine a politics uh, outside of the state. It's the movement from the impossible uh, to the policy, uh, to the possible. And um, in that Lacanian sense, do not give up on your desire. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, it, beautiful. Also, it's all for now to uh, to thank the, the panelists, um, Hilda, Ann, and Laura, both for your. Uh, remarkable contributions to the book and, and also for um, taking the time to appear here and, and uh, um, enlighten us with your uh, thoughts, not just about your, your, your chapters, but also about the contemporary situation.
Um, I'd like to also thank uh, all the participants uh, for being with us and for your questions and comments. I'm sorry we couldn't get to, to all of them, um, but uh, hopefully addressed uh, uh, most of them. Uh, and um, <laughs> really look forward to seeing uh, you guys uh, next week. So uh, same time, same place. Uh, I think next week is is going to uh, also be an, an, an excellent panel. Uh, we have uh, Ajay uh, Gudavarti, who I mentioned, uh, referred to his book, uh, Helmut Harry uh, Lowen, um, who is uh, um, a Manitoba-based um, uh, uh, intellectual and anti-fascist activist, a long time, uh, long standing. Uh, he's also an associate uh, of ours at the at the institute. Um, we have uh, Joan Brown, who will be speaking uh, about the alt right, and, and, and Steve Bannon, um, Patricia Barkaskis, who will be speaking about uh, indigenous perspectives on uh, fascism, um, and of course settler colonialism. And uh, last but not least, uh, Vladimir Zapata, who will be um, uh, speaking to us. Well, he could be speaking to us from anywhere in the world, but he's based. In, in Sao Paulo. Um, and I just want to put a little plug in for uh, an interview that uh, it should appear fairly imminently in the journal Crisis. Uh, uh, it's a, a conversation between uh, myself and Vladimir about the situation in Brazil. Uh, it's called uh, the, the Brazilian Matrix Between Neoliberalism and Fascism. So I think next, uh, next week will also be a really uh, uh, fascinating uh, panel. So um, hope to see you guys there. Thank you all. And uh, have a wonderful weekend. Thank Goodbye. you. That's great. Bye. Bye. Thank you.